This is Dave Meltzer with Entrepreneurs the Playbook, and I have a venture capitalist slash entrepreneur here, CEO President Adnan Durrani from Saffron Road, which he has stocked my entire studio and office. And I'm looking at this chicken meatball dish going, I want this so bad. Anyway, <laughs> what I like about the CPG space um, is that there's a variety of ways that people, number one, get into it, mm -hmm. but also, two, get out of it. Mm -hmm. And I think both are very important when you're talking about conglomerates, multi-conglomerates, how the equities work and the venture side of these big businesses work. And a lot of it is pre-contrived now. You know, I know so many P&E guys uh, that come in with the idea of how do we build this exact brand to either be acquired or invested in and specifically know a formula to do that. Now, you went to Columbia. Mm -hmm. Obviously, parents put a lot of pressure on you to do <laughs> right. well in school. You think no pressure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's Jewish guilt, Pakistani guilt. Right. We're all the same. Exactly. Kosher, yeah. halal. It's the same guilt. <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly the feeling. Exactly. I had a Jewish mother, you know. So. <laughs> there you go. You get it, man. Um, but you did not immediately get into the branding side of things, you were right. a money person. Yeah, correct. And how important is that education and background in what you do today? Sure, it's a very good question. Dave, first of all, I want to thank you for making the time and We finally did it. Yeah, mission accomplished. <laughs> uh, and you know, it's, it's yeah, so I like to joke that I came from the dark side. You know, <laughs> I, I was on the venture side, actually on the investment banking side for many years at Lehman Brothers. And I'm gonna age myself, but during the original crash, the go-go 80s, 87, is where I had an epiphany and I had a crisis of conscious. Uh, I, I was, you know, hit a bottom financially, mentally, uh, as well as spiritually, and decided that I needed to do something a different way. And since I had my own investment firm and I had uh, a, a bit of foray in the beverage industry, more the natural organic industry, like 35 years ago, when it didn't exist, it was a very tiny sector at that time, um, I saw a path towards you know, building businesses. So I came from the media gratification business, which was, you know, Wall Street trading, institutional sales, to what I call the delayed gratification business, which was the venture side, which was really building businesses and help them helping them grow. But for me, it had to be something a bit more impactful than that because of the you know, the, the epiphany that I had back in 1990, say. Um, and so as a result, I was very fortunate that at that time I was, uh, I got introduced to a bunch of folks from a group called Social Venture Network. 30 plus years ago, I was one of the original members. Um, and my former partner, Gary Hirschberg, really schooled me in social responsibility, as well as Ben Cohen, who was, who was you know, a good, good colleague of mine, and Eileen Fisher. And they really taught me this idea of triple bottom line, of socially responsible businesses, which really identified with my values. And so even though I came from a very conservative household and conservative upbringing, all of a sudden I was with these socialists, uh, like right. say there are a bunch of socialists who became capitalists, uh, who showed me a different passionate way. Passionate capitalists, passionate capitalists. I wrote about, right? Yeah. It's interesting because I'm listening to you talk about 87 through 90 and knowing the pressure that you were under and you know the fetus isn't fully developed until after graduate school, doctor, right. lawyer, failure. We all know the systematic routine of success in America yeah. for our generation. It's systemic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But you sit there, and, and I had this epiphany as well at one time going, I did everything my parents told me to do. Like, this is the way that I yeah. felt, right? Yeah, yeah. I graduated Absolutely. from the school they told me to graduate from. Right. I, I, I was a good person. I studied hard. And... I have nothing to show for it, and I'm in an empty existence. You know, there's nothing fulfilling about what I'm doing in in this space. I could identify more. That's exactly how <laughs> I felt when the crash happened on Wall Street, and I said, "Yeah, I could jump back in," uh, but I really felt that, that some some reason a voice in my head said, "That's not the path for you." And I was so grateful, as painful as it was, to switch and be on no income for a couple of years and rebuild my career. Uh, I was very fortunate that I was able to follow that path. What type of social pressure were you under? When I say social pressure, I mean, here you are, Columbia grad, Wall Street success. Now, not only have you bottomed out, but you're not making any money, and yet your parents still have the same expectations and brand for you, and your friends now, right? Because you went to those same school, you know. The you, colleagues, yeah. Yeah, the yeah. colleagues and the friends, and like, yeah. you feel like every, mixers. <laughs> right, you feel like everybody yeah. knows you're a loser. Yeah. I hate to say it, but yeah. I've been through this, yeah. and I felt like, Gosh, not only did I do everything I was supposed to do, yeah. but I'm the pariah of my family and my friends. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, you know, I, I definitely felt 
that there was something less than and that I hadn't accomplished what I really wanted to, even though when I was on Wall Street, I, I was extremely successful. And so when the crash happened, the dichotomy from such a high to such a low yeah. was that much more punishing, right? Um, I know uh, that feeling, my yeah. friend. And so, Read my story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. And so you identify totally. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, I, and so I went through that. And, yeah, there was a lot of pressure, obviously, because, you know, being an immigrant, we were taught when we were very young that, you know, that you, you have to be better than everybody else. You have to succeed. You have to work 10 times harder. And I did all of those things. And all of a sudden, I was faced with this, you know, epiphany that I was in. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was difficult to do it. But quite frankly, um, I found so much more comfort in my own skin when I made that pivot. I felt I, I was sleeping very well at night, even though I wasn't making any money initially. Yeah. And I felt I was really building towards something that fit what my values were about. Like I started to say, you know, Gary and a lot of the people, Hirschberg and others at Social Venture Network were really from a more a hippie generation. I wasn't. You know? Right. Uh, and so at first it was a little bit of a uh, culture clash with me. Uh, but then I realized, wait a minute, their values are exactly my values. You know, the mm -hmm. values around making sure that what we're doing is respectful to the earth, making sure what we're doing um, is, is for the betterment of humanity, and making sure that, you know, there, isn't, there is a world out there that's not just about linear one directional profits. I mean, triple bottom line for us back then was really about giving back to community, giving back to the earth and the environment, and giving back to all stakeholders, not just shareholders, but employees as well, and what benefits and how do you take care of them. But when we started to talk about that in 1990 and 1988, uh, people like our investors would look at us like we had nine heads. Like, what right. are you talking about? <laughs> you know, when yeah. Gary decided- Marijuana is not legal yet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> when Gary was giving 20% of the profits of Stonyfield back to Profits for the Planet, which was a, 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 a foundation he started, you know, investors would look at me and say, "But wait a minute, that's our money. What? What? Why is that going back into, you know, uh, into these these organizations, these charitable causes you have?" I said, "No, it's it's an investment. It's actually not charity because we're building the brand. And believe it or not, if you have values behind a brand, that's what will resonate and create even more shareholder value. So we got lucky that way. That that's exactly what happened." Yeah, it's funny that you use the word luck because when I ran Lee Steinberg, the sports agency, everyone thought we were nuts that we'd only take players that would create a foundation or procure a cause and give a tiding, and we made it a requirement of anyone that we represented. And mm -hmm. Lee was convinced that it gave him a competitive edge because not only did it, it align him uh, value-wise with the parents and the child, mm -hmm. the athlete, right. but more importantly with the community, that it then became a negotiation uh, point or a leverage that we could use when they went to try to, you know, trade him or not sign him because he gave so much back. Hmm. The community, there was so much pressure to keep Tony Gwynn in San Diego. Yeah. You know, yeah. no matter what he was. And so I see this paradigm shift in my own life and I see it with what you've done hmm. and this delayed gratification. I always say it's detachment. People don't understand. We work still hard, smart, and long. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you were happy as a clam, you were still working long days. Still am. <laughs> yeah, still. <laughs> that's why still I have me all too. These white hairs. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm losing <laughs> yeah. my hair. Uh, but there, there's something to be said that we lost that, you know, quarterly end of year, like this pressure that we put on ourselves that did not understand time. Yeah. How did you, coming from you know a very pragmatic background, and a pressureful background? deal with the concept of I got plenty of time that you know this is we're going to invest 20 percent into our environment we're going to invest this into other people mm -hmm. and in the long run whether it's 10 years 20 years or 30 years whatever it is I'm detached from that I just mm -hmm. am going to do what's right today according to my values how did you make that shift sure uh, I'm not so, so sure it was as much detachment as mm -hmm. it was engagement so okay good uh, I, I would say that and, I, and I, I wouldn't say necessarily saying I have all the time in the world I would say that um you know, as opposed to where we, you know, you're only as good as your last trade on Wall Street. You know, everything's immediate. <laughs> uh, we we thought, okay, let's come up with a three phase or five phase plan. The first two years, this is what we plan to do. The next couple of years, we might evolve to this model, and then so on. But there was there was kind of a, an, an evolution that we understood that the brand or the business would take. And we made sure that all the team members were bought into that and were passionate about it and understood what the expectations were because. Even as a socially responsible company, we have to deliver on results, right? right. If you're out of business, I, it's not going to happen. Yeah, help it's anyone. like I used to mentor a lot of young kids, and they'd say, you know, young college grads, and 
They say, oh, I, I just want to really do good and, and I want to start a social responsible business and I'm willing to give 100% of the profits away. And I said, well, you know, 100% of zero is zero. <laughs> <laughs> so you first have to generate a business and create some profits. So it is really important, especially for social responsible businesses to not take the eye off the ball, which is to have discipline, to have a timeline, to have a plan as to how you're going to perform and what are the deliverables or metrics or KPIs to get there. But the nice thing about what we were doing is that when we started in the social responsible mo movement, way back when, I mean, we really were, I mean, a, a number of my colleagues and us were the pioneers in that sector. Uh, we were fortunate because the things that we were doing, whether it's Eileen Fisher in, in clothing or design, or whether it's us in National Organic Foods, had a direct correlation to causality. Um, so we were part of the original Cone Report that authored the whole concept of causality around brands. Um, and we could see a direct causality. We could see that when we you know, in a respectful and mindful way pontificated what our socially responsible values were, consumers would pay more for that service or pay more for that brand that had stronger price elasticity on the shelf. So since I saw that immediately, just in the first couple of years that I was an entrepreneur, you know, my wife and I started Vermont Pure Springwater, and it was, that was an interesting, you know, you know business to, to build. But we saw that causality right away. We, certainly, we certainly feel was a leader in it. Um, so because we saw that correlation immediately, uh, we were, that's why I loved food so much. It was very creative. It was something that we had direct social impact on, and it's something that we were really bettering a, certain, uh, you know, a lot of people's lives with. There's also the quantum memory of your Jewish mother giving <laughs> right. food. You're right, exactly. Giving, man. You're feeding people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Transitioning then, though, from venture mm -hmm. into being CEO of Saffron Road, where you have you know, the halal certification, a huge market. Mm -hmm. I kind of cringe when I saw the product because I was approached years ago from a certification company hmm. that was going to be the halal certifier, like the kosher rabbis that right, did right. kosher. And oh, I thought it was an extraordinary idea. Yeah. I just couldn't get my ha hands around what this market would be, thinking of companies like Saffron Road that would come well, out. I'm amazed that you know about that. See, it tells me that you're not only a global citizen, but you know what the halal you're talking about. Oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> but I'm, I love your sense of humor. That's <laughs> awesome. I'm going to go there soon. <laughs> yeah. um, but meanwhile, you are building a multi-million dollar company. Absolutely. And there's yeah. even a bigger market out there. I think this is a pre-chasm mm -hmm. to what we're about to see in this space. Sure. And the nice thing is, how much did you model this off of you know, gluten-free, kosher certification, right? It is a food certified uh, play, in sure. my opinion, but high quality food. I've been, like I said, eating it. I almost had to stop the podcast because I was choking <laughs> over a chickpea. Right. Um, <laughs> I said it had water on me. <laughs> I'm still going to eat the meatballs later. Yeah. But more, more importantly, you know, this certification is unique. Mm -hmm. It's growing. Tell me about how you deciphered, yeah, this is going to be a really good venture because it yeah. is. And, you know, we, we, the name Zafran Road is there because um, Yo-Yo Ma many years ago, right after 9-11, did a beautiful uh, a program on the mall in Washington uh, where he brought in artisans from 200 different countries, about 160 different countries, most of which were Muslim countries right after 9-11. I don't know how he got them visas. But it was a beautiful <laughs> display of the diversity of world cultures. And he, they all had their musicians there and their dresses and their food. And it was sharing the common values that people around the world share, which was an amazing show of compassion and respect and diversity. Um, and I said, you know, for 20 plus years, I've devoted my life to social responsible enterprises. And I said, I haven't really done anything that brings in this, even 10 years ago, in this disparate environment we're in, that can be a social uh, activator of bringing cultures together and different faiths together. So I remember that the Silk Road had Zafran on it as the premium price, you know, kind of as the gold standard. Yeah. Um, and I said, you know, that would be a great name for a brand, and the socially responsible model would be bringing people of different faiths and cultures together to share the diversity, to champion their differences and celebrate their commonality, and at the same time enjoy a, an awesome meal. Uh, and that was kind of the, the whole concept of Zafran Road, of world ethical world cuisines. That's how it came together. And so I said halal would be a great starting point for that. Uh, and the reason I felt strongly about that was that I studied uh, halal intensely in Europe and here for many years. And I saw here the demographics were the complete opposite of Europe. So, for example, in, in uh, Europe, your average French Muslim is about 60 or 70 percent undereducated, whereas in America, according to Pew, 
one out of five American households, American Muslim households, has a PhD or MD in it. Uh, according to Gallup, the second most educated woman in America is an American Muslim woman after the American Jewish woman. And there's about four to eight million American Muslims in this country, $30 billion in food buying power, uh, 70% under the age of 40. I mean, it's a marketer's dream. Yeah. And nobody's marketing. Them. Nobody marketing. not a single halal brand. So I thought that would be a nice starting point, but that's where we would begin, not end. And I thought just like, you know, you report to higher authority like Hebrew National, where kosher, you know, 70 or 80 percent of the consumers are not even Jewish. Right. It's just that it, ha- it, 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 it exudes a higher value standard. But I wanted to make this authentically value based. So we said, let's let's really take the high road here on halal. Let's because a big part of halal is humane animal welfare. So we were the first certified humane entree in the world. We were the first non-GMO verified entree in the world. Um, and, you know, a lot of our products are all gluten free, like 80 percent of our line. So uh, that was really the 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 atmosphere, kind of the platform I was looking for. And I thought if we could do that and build a brand around that, then eventually, you know, long term overseas would also be an opportunity because halal is a two trillion dollar industry outside the US. So that's how that that was kind of the beginnings. But today, eighty five percent of our consumers are not even halal centric. Right. They're mainstream North natural organic consumers. And we've been very fortunate. We're the number one natural organic protein brand in the country. Uh, we're only second to Amy's, which is a vegetarian brand, but in protein, we're number one. And that's because of quality and taste. Exactly. And it really makes a difference. You may have caught a niche, but it's sprung or amplified because of the quality and taste. Yeah, that's our, that's our dedication. And I, mean, I, and I recognize that right away. When I was utilizing and, and you know, really getting to taste through your, your line here yeah. of healthy products, which is, you yeah. know, by luck or by design. No, that was by design. R- r- right, take no shortcuts. Yeah, yeah. right, yeah. right, was, was there. Mm. It's interesting, though, too, because I remember the Hebrew National Campaign, right, what really took that brand was we come from a higher source, right? Yeah, it's like higher that authority. Higher, yeah. higher authority. Yeah. And I was thinking that's exactly what Saffron Road is, right? There's a yeah. higher authority yeah. that is is not in a dogmatic religious sense at all. Right, not at all. And, it's about and kosher is the same way. It's about value. Yeah, I mean, the CEO of Empire Kosher Poultry uh, is on our board. I mean, he's not CEO anymore, but he yeah. was CEO of Empire Kosher Poultry. So we really did uh, look at that model very closely. But we also wanted to, uh, the different, I mean, halal and kosher are very similar, if not identical. Yeah. There's a couple of differences. I mean, you can have a halal cheeseburger. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. You can't have a halal wine like Manischewitz. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and also halal is very concerned about animal humane welfare. So and I'm glad kosher is going in that direction now too. Sure. So these were, you know, like you have, you know, you have of course glot kosher and you have thayyib halal. So yep. you, there's different levels, but we really wanted to go to that higher level and 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 talk about. We'd like to say it's a journey to better. It's a journey that's better for the farmers. A journey that's better, obviously, for the livestock with animal humane welfare. It's a journey that's better for the environment. It's a journey that's obviously better for humanity. Consumer, but yeah. most of all, it's better tasting. Yeah, it's better for the consumer, exactly. Yeah. Which all products should be. Are there halal and kosher? Uh, this one is kosher yes. and halal. I just yes. Because I was looking at some of the products are and aren't. Yeah. And someone upstairs who keeps kosher was asking me, can it be both? I go, yeah, absolutely. I think they're very similar. Yeah. So what it, it, you can definitely do it on vegetarian items. And most of our vegetarian items, like our simmer sauces and our meals, these are crushing it in Costco right now. Um <laughs> These are uh, the dual halal and kosher because yeah. there's no meat involved. But when you have meat involved, you They'll might get, get a holy war. Right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. so we, you know, the rabbi uh, will say, who, who, who slotted it first or was it the imam? So it's a little bit more tricky, although I know a couple of colleagues and friends of mine that are working very, uh, you know, uh, diligently to get a dual halal kosher meat certification. Wow. Uh, Joe Rigenstein, who's a, a good friend, used to be on our advisory board. He was the chair of uh, Cornell's food ag program. Um, and he's, he actually taught me more about halal than I know. I think his father was a rabbi, and he knew so much about kosher and halal. It was amazing. That's, that's, that's my brother. I tell him all the time because he obviously keeps kosher. And yeah. I always tell him that uh, my stomach answers to the higher source <laughs> of right. taste. Of taste, right. Exactly. <laughs> that's the higher value. Exactly. That's the value. Halal, kosher, it doesn't matter. Dave Meltzer, I eat what tastes good. Yeah. All right, last question. You know, you really are making a significant difference, not just as an entrepreneur, mm-hmm. but you sit on a lot of different boards, from entrepreneurs to the visitors. Mm-hmm. You know, as you get to a mature existence, you know, in your career, what's that final chapter look like in in your entrepreneurial career? You know, I, I somebody asked me this question the other day, actually, and, and I, I, I think there's so much opportunity for young companies now and young entrepreneurs, like, 
there was never this kind of uh, ecosystem when I was starting out. So young entrepreneurs really have tremendous opportunity right now. And uh, there was a study out, I, I mentioned this all the time, but Boston Consulting Group and IRI a couple of years ago that said 43% of the growth of the $800 billion food and beverage industry is coming from small companies like Saffron Road. Um, so I, I would love sometime in the future to be more involved in setting up some kind of incubator for, uh, for really for disenfranchised young entrepreneurs, whether it's female-run businesses or whether it's minority or people of color who really don't get a fair shake. And I think there's so much opportunity for them right now um, you know, that uh, I, I think in the future that would be a wonderful thing for me to be involved in. I got to get you involved. I'm the chief chancellor of Junior Achievement University with Bob Proctor, Jack Canfield, Sharon oh, Lecter, and Variety. Oh. It'd be a perfect mid-step for you to get involved. I'd love to have you involved with Junior Achievement because you would be an extraordinary mentor to so many people. Thank you. Saffron Road, extraordinary company. Adnan Durrani, extraordinary CEO and president of go, Saffron Road. Go to Costco, Road. buy it now. Yeah, <laughs> or Whole Foods. <laughs> yeah. I buy it there. Yeah, yeah. I don't take everything for free. <laughs> Dave Meltzer, Entrepreneurs, The Playbook.